Good afternoon everybody, I'm Robert from El Magnifico Games and today we are going to continue with another Poetry, Prose and Riddles stream. Now last week we finished off on a poem entitled A Song for St. Cecilia's Day by John Dryden, published in 1687 apparently. John Dryden was this individual, uh, an English poet, literary critic, translator and playwright who was appointed to England's first poet laureate in 1668. Good afternoon, Jenny. So, as usual, we will begin with a rereading of the poem that we left off on last week. In fact, this was the only poem we covered last week. Uh, and then we will move on to uh, some new poems. So, I shall begin. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began, when nature underneath a heap of jarring atoms lay, and could not heave her head, the tuneful voice was heard from high, Arise ye more than dead, Then cold and hot and moist and dry, In order to their stations leap, And music's power obey, From harmony, from heavenly harmony, This universal frame began, From harmony to harmony, Through all the compass of the notes it ran, The diapason closing full in man. What passion cannot music raise and quell, When jubil struck the corded shell, his listening brethren stood around, and wondering on their faces fell, to worship that celestial sound, less than a god they thought they could not dwell, within the hollow of that shell, that spoke so sweetly and so well, what passion cannot music raise and quell. The trumpet's loud clang o'er, excites us to arms, with shrill notes of anger and mortal alarms. The double, double, double beat of the thundering drum cries, hark, the foes come, charged, tis too late to retreat. The soft complaining flute in dying notes discovers the woes of hopeless lovers, whose dirge is whispered by the warbling lute. Sharp violins proclaim their jealous pangs and desperation, fury, frantic indignation, depths of pain and height of passion for the fair disdainful dame. But oh, what art can teach, what human voice can reach, the sacred organ's praise, notes inspiring holy love, Notes that wing their heavenly ways to mend the choirs above. Orpheus could lead the savage race, and trees uprooted left their place. Sequacious of the lyre, but bright Cecilia raised the wonder higher. When to her organ vocal breath was given, an angel heard and straight appeared, mistaking earth for heaven. As the power of sacred lays, the spheres began to move, and sung the great creator's praise to all the blessed above. So when the last and dreadful hour, this crumbling pageant shall devour, devour, the trumpet shall be heard on high, the dead shall live, the living die, and music shall untune the sky. Now oh, that's okay, Jenny. I'm actually going to be a little unorthodox here and double check a few words that I know I looked up last week Sequacious. Likely to follow or yield to physical pressure, easily shaped or moulded. Uh, following neatly or smoothly in musical notes or poetic feet. So that's what would be meant by sequacious of the lyre. Lays. If 
recall correctly, I had to look that up in my physical dictionary. Short lyric or narrative poem meant to be sung. So that'll be what? Uh, as from the power of sacred lays means. Are there any more? Diapason. Musical octave from through notes. Also oh, from through all, as in through all notes. Yeah. I think that's. Uh, all the words I wanted to double check there, so perhaps I will actually give it a second and final reading today, just before we move on to the next poem. So, one last time. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began, where nature underneath a heap of jarring atoms lay, and could not heave her head, the tuneful voice was heard from high, arising more than dead, then cold and hot and moist and dry, in order to their stations leap, and music's power obey, from harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began, from harmony to harmony, through all the compass of the notes it ran, the diapason closing full in man, or passion cannot music raise and quell, when Jubal struck the corded shell, his listening brethren stood around, and wondering on their faces fell, to worship that celestial sound. Less than a god they thought they could not dwell, within the hollow of that shell, that spoke so sweetly and so well, what passion cannot music raise and quell. The trumpet's loud clangor excites us to arms, with shrill notes of anger and mortal alarms. The double, double, double beat of the thundering drum cries, hark, the foes come, Charged, tis too late to retreat. The soft complaining flute in dying notes discovers the woes of hopeless lovers, whose dirges whispered by the warbling lute. Sharp violins proclaim their jealous pangs and desperation, fury, frantic indignation, depths of pain and height of passion for the fair disdainful dame. dame. But oh, what art can teach, what human voice can reach, the sacred organ's praise, notes inspiring holy love, notes that wing their heavenly ways to mend the choirs above. Orpheus could lead the savage race, and trees uprooted left their place, sequacious of the lyre, bright Cecilia raised the wonder higher, when to her organ vocal breath was given, an angel heard and straight appeared, mistaking earth for heaven. As from the power of sacred lays, the spheres began to move, and sung the great creator's praise to all the blessed above, so when the last and dreadful hour, this crumbling pageant shall devour, devour the trumpet shall be heard on high, the dead shall live, the living die, and music shall untune the sky. So. That was a song for St. Cecilia's Day by John Dryden. So next, we have a piece entitled Song. Presumably, then, its title isn't known, I would assume, by Oliver Goldsmith. The wretch condemned with life to part still still hopes on relies, and every pang that rends the heart bids expectation rise, hope like the glimmering taper's light. 
the doors adorns and cheers the way, and still as darker grows the night, emits a brighter ray. Hmm, interesting. I assume that's talking about the mental state of a person that has been sentenced to death. I may be misunderstanding this. Uh, taper, thin candles used for lighting other candles. Hope like the glimmering taper's light that dawns and cheers away, and still as darker grows the night emits a brighter ray. Interesting. So, I assume that is what it's about. It says the wretch condemned with life to part. I don't see what else that could mean other than an individual that's been condemned to, that's been sentenced to death. Still, still on hope relies, and every pang that rends the heart bids expectation rise. Hope, like the glimmering taper's light, adorns and cheers the way, and still as darker grows the night, emits a brighter ray. So I think that's describing an individual that's been sentenced to death in the way that... As the situation becomes less and less hopeful, they have greater and greater expectations that something will intervene. I may be misunderstanding this poem, but that's the only meaning I think I can draw from it. It's certainly an interesting subject matter. I don't remember uh, us covering a poem quite like it. Probably should have looked him up first. Oliver Goldsmith was an Anglo-Irish novelist, playwright, dramatist and poet. He is best known for his no novel, The Vicar of Wakefield, his pastoral poem, The Deserted Village, and his plays, The Good-Natured Man and She Stoops to Conquer. He is thought to have written the classic children's tale, The History of Little Goody Two-Shoes. Ah, I have heard of that. Never read it. I've heard of it. Interesting. So, he's Georgian, clearly. Goldsmith's birth date and year are not known with certainty. According to the Library of Congress authority file, he told a biographer that he was born on the 10th of November 1728. The location of his birthplace is also uncertain. He was born either in the townland of Pallas, near uh, Ballymahon, County Longford, Ireland, where his father was the Anglican curate of the parish of Forgney, I'm probably butchering his pronunciations, I apologise, or at the residence of his maternal grandparents at the Smith Hill House near Elfin in County Roscommon, where his grandfather, Oliver Jones, was a clergyman and master of the Elfin Dio. Season? What would it be? It'd be a I'm gonna have to look up the pronunciation of that. I think that's diocesan. Obviously it relates to a diocese, which I may be also mispronouncing. No, that looks right. Just, uh, at, of the Elfin Diocesan School and where Oliver studied. When Goldsmith was two years old, his father was appointed the rector of the parish of Kilkenny West in County Westmeath. The family moved to the parsonage at Leesoy between Athlon and Ballymayon and continued to live there until his father's death in 1747. 
1744, Goldsmith went up to Trinity College, Dublin. His tutor was Thika Wilder. Neglecting his studies in philology and law, he fell to the bottom of his class. Uh, in 1747, along with four other undergraduates, he was expelled for a riot in which they attempted to storm the uh, Marshall Sea Prison. Who? Why? Who was graduated in 1749 as a Bachelor of Arts, but without the discipline or distinction that might have gained him entry to the profession to a profession in the church or the or the law. So they just said he was expelled. His education seemed to have given him mainly a taste for fine clothes, playing cards, singing Irish airs, and playing the flute. He lived for a short time with his mother, tried various professions without success, studied medicine uh, desultorily, Jumping or passing warrant from one thing or subject to another without order planning or rational connection, lacking logical sequence. Interesting. Uh, he studied medicine desultory at the University of Edinburgh. From, 1740, uh, from 1752 to 1755, and set out on a walking tour of Flanders, France, Switzerland, and northern Italy, living by his wits, busking with his flute. He settled in London in 1756, where he briefly held various jobs, including an apothecary's, an apothecary's assistant and an usher of a school. Uh, perennially in debt and addicted to gambling, Goldsmith produced a massive output as a hack writer on Grub Street. Uh, until the early 19th century, Grub Street was a street close to London's impoverished Moorfield district that ran from Fall Street east of St. Giles without Cripple Gate, north to Chiswell Street. It was pierced along its length with narrow entrances to alleys and courts, many of which retained the names of early signboards. Its bohemian society was set amidst the impoverished neighbourhood's low rent doss houses, brothels and coffee houses. Famous for its concentration of impoverished hack writers, aspiring poets and low-end publishers and booksellers, Grub Street existed in the margins of London's journalistic and literary scene. According to Samuel Johnson's dictionary, the term was originally the name of a street much inhabited by writers of small histories, dictionaries and temporary poems, uh, whence any mean production is called Grub Street. Johnson himself had lived and worked on Grub Street early in his career. The contemporary image of Grub Street was popularised by Alexander Pope in his uh, Dunciad. The street was later renamed Milton Street, which was partly swallowed up by the Barbican estate development, but still survives in part. The street name no longer exists, but Grub Street has since become a pejorative term for impoverished hack writers and writers of low literary value. So that's what Grub Street was. Um, so, Goldsmith produced a massive output as a hack writer on Grub Street for the publishers of London, but his few painstaking works earned him the company of Samuel Johnson, with whom he was a founding member of the club. Uh, the club, or literary club, is a London dining club founded in February 1764 by the artist Joshua Reynolds and the essayist uh, Samuel Johnson with Edmund Burke, the Anglo-Irish philosopher-politician. Initially, the club would meet one evening per week at seven at the Turk's Head Inn in uh, Grand Street, Soho. Later meetings were reduced to one per fortnight whilst Parliament was in session and were held at rooms in St. James's Street. Though the initial formation was proposed by Sir Joshua Reynolds, Dr. Samuel Johnson became the person most closely associated with the club. Now, let's not get too far off topic. Uh, with whom he was a founding member of the club. There, through fellow club member Edmund Burke, he made the acquaintance of Sir George Saville, who would later arrange a job for him at Thornhill Grammar School. The combination of his literary work and his uh, dissolute lifestyle led Horace Walpole, 
to give him the ep epithet Inspired Idiot. During this period, he used the pseudonym James Willington, the name of a fellow student at Trinity, to publish his 1758 translation of the autobiography of uh, Hunot Jean Martelle, which I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of. In his life, Washington Irving states that Goldsmith was between 5'4 and 5'6 in height, not heavily built but quite muscular and with rather plain features. In character, he had a lively sense of fun, was totally guileless, and never happier than when in the light-hearted company of children. The money that he sporadically earned was often uh, frittered away or happily given away to the next good cause that presented itself, so that any financial security tended to be fleeting and short-lived. Goldsmith's talents were unreservedly recognised by Samuel Johnson, whose patronage, somewhat resented by Boswell, aided his eventual recognition in the literary world and the world of drama. Goldsmith was described by contemporaries as prone to envy, a congenial but impetuous and disorganised personality who once planned to emigrate to America but failed because he missed his ship. At some point around this time he worked at Thornhill Grammar School, later facing uh, Squire Thornhill in the Vicar of Wakefield on his benefactor Sir George Seville and certainly spending time with eminent scientist Reverend John Mitchell, whom he probably knew from London. Mitchell sorely missed good company, which Goldsmith naturally provided in spades. Thomas de Quincey wrote of him, All the motion of Goldsmith's nature moved in the direction of the true, the natural, the sweet, the gentle. His premature death in 1774 may have been partly due to his own misdiagnosis of his kidney infection. Goldsmith was buried in Temple Church in London. The inscription reads, Here lies Oliver Goldsmith. A monument was originally raised to him at the site of his burial, but this was destroyed in an air raid in 1941. A monument to him survives in the centre of uh, Ballymahon, also in Westminster Abbey, with an epitaph written by Samuel Johnson. Among his papers was found the perspective of its, the prospectus of an encyclopedia to be called the Universal Dictionary of the Arts and Sciences. He wished this to be the British equivalent of the Encyclopedia, which I'm also probably butchering the pronunciation of. You know, it was to include comprehensive articles by Samuel Johnson, Edmund Burke, Adam Smith, Edward Gibbon, Sir Joshua Reynolds, Sir William Jones, uh, Fox and Dr. Burney. The project, however, was not realised due to Goldsmith's death. Uh, so I won't read the entire Wikipedia page, but that should give us a sense of who he was, the uh, author of this poem. So, once again, the wretch condemned with life to part still, still on hope relies, and every pang that rends a heart bids expectation rise. Hope, like the glimmering taper's light, adorns and cheers away, and still a darker, and still as darker grows the night, emits a brighter ray. So as far as rhyming's concerned, we clearly have an A B A B structure. Um, what do we have in terms of rhythm? Okay, so we have a consistent eight syllables, six syllables, eight syllables, six syllables structure here. I think it has 
may also have a sort of broken iambic structure. I think in general it's trying to make the even numbered syllables stressed, but in some cases it falls short of that. I could be wrong. This isn't a subject on which I'm well versed, but I think that's what's going on here. So that covers the meaning of the poem, the context, its rhythmic and rhyming structures. We've discussed the fact that it's an interesting subject. So is there anything else people would like to discuss about this poem? If there is, please put it into chat. I will read it once more. Then I will check chat, discuss anything that needs to be discussed, and then we will move on. So, the wretch condemned with life to part, still on hope relies, and every pang that rends the heart bids expectation rise. Hope like the glimmering taper's light adorns and cheers the way, and still as dark a gross at night emits a brighter ray. Okay, looks like there isn't uh, anything more to discuss. Um, if there is, um, don't. If there is stuff that you'd like to discuss. By all means, write it now and we'll go back. But otherwise, we'll move on. Hmm, I'm not sure that page was supposed to be formatted that way. So next we are moving on to a poem by Thomas Gray, entitled Elegy Written in a County Churchyard. Oh, a country churchyard. That makes more sense. Goodness, this is... Quite a long one. I will double check what an elegy is. A mournful or plaintive poem, a funeral song, a poem of lamentation. And Thomas Gray. Hello, mindful. Um, yeah. Just uh, going through some poetry. Then we'll be moving on to Pride and Prejudice and finally riddles, as usual. How about you? How have you been? So, Thomas Gray, who was this? was an English poet, letter writer, classical scholar and professor at Pembroke College, Cambridge. He is widely known for his elegy written in a country churchyard, published in 1751, which is what we're about to uh, look at next. So after we've been through, after we've looked at it, it may be interesting to check what the Wikipedia page has to say about it too. Oh, nice. Uh, Gray was a self-critical writer who published only 13 poems in his lifetime, despite being very popular. He was even offered the position of Poet Laureate in 1757, though he declined. So that would have been... Would that have been just after John Dryden... Had uh, finished as poet laureate, would that have made Thomas um, Gray the second? No, I'm getting my dates well mixed up. Dryden was much earlier. Oh yeah, because he was in office when Charles the second was. Okay, so yeah, this is much later on. This is. Uh, almost 90 years later, I think. Uh, Gray was... Yep, we've read that. His writing is conventionally considered to be pre-romantic, but recent critical developments deny such theological classification. 
So, who was it? Thomas Gray was born in Cornhill, London. His father, Philip Gray, was a scrivener. What does a scrivener do? A scrivener was a person who could read and write or who wrote letters to court and legal documents. Scriveners were people who made their living by writing or copying written material. This usually indicated secretarial and administrative duties such as da 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 da. Uh, and his mother, Dorothy Anthrobus, Atrobus, was a milliner. Hat maker or millinery is the design, manufacture, and sale of hats and other headwear. So, middle class, in other words. He was the fifth of tw 12 children and the only one to survive infancy. Goodness. He lived with his mother after she left his abusive and mentally unwell father. Wow. Wow. That's unfortunate. Gray's mother paid for him to go to Eton College, where his uncles, Robert and William Antrobus, worked. Robert became Gray's first teacher and helped inspire Gray a love for botany and observational science. Gray's other uncle, William, became his tutor. He recorded his school days as a time of great happiness, as is evident and evident in his ode on a distant prospect of Eton College. Gray was a delicate and scholarly boy who spent his time reading and avoiding athletics. He lived in his uncle's household rather than at college. He made three close friends at Eton, Horace Walpole, son of the Prime Minister Robert Walpole, uh, Thomas Ashton and Richard West, son of another Richard West who was briefly Lord Chancellor of Ireland. The four prided themselves on their sense of style, sense of humour and an appreciation of beauty. They were called the Quadruple Alliance. In 1734, Gray went up to Peterhouse, Cambridge, where he found the cur curriculum dull. He wrote letters to friends listing all the things he disliked. The masters, mad with pride, and the fellows, sleepy, drunken, dull, illiterate things. Intended by his family for the law, he spent most of his time as an undergraduate reading classical and modern literature and playing Vivaldi and Scarlatti on the harpsichord for re relaxation. According to college tradition, he left Peterhouse for Pembroke College after being the victim of a practical joke played by undergraduates. Gray is supposed to have been afraid of fire and had attached a bar outside his window to which a rope could be tied. After being woken by undergraduates with fire made of shavings, Gray climbed down the rope but landed in a tub of water which had been placed below his window. In 1738, he accompanied his old school friend Walpole on his grand tour of Europe, possibly at Walpole's expense. The two fell out and parted in Tuscany because Walpole wanted to attend fashionable parties and Gray wanted to visit all the antiquities. They were reconciled a few years later. It was Walpole who later helped publish Gray's poetry. When Gray sent his most famous poem, Elegy, to Walpole, Walpole sent off the poem as a manuscript and it appeared in different magazines. Gray then published the poem himself and received the credit he was due. Okay, so we won't read the whole page but that's who he was so elegy written in a country churchyard the curfew tolls the knell of parting day the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lay the ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me now fades a glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air is a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds, save that from yonder ivy mantled tower the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath these rugged elms that yew trees shade, I heave the turf in many a map moundering heap mouldering heap each in his narrow cell for ever laid the rude forefathers of this hamlet sleep the breezy call of incense breathing morn the swallow twittering from the straw built shed the cock shrill clarus clarion on the echoing horn no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed for them no more the blazing hearth shall burn or busy housewives ply her evening care. No children run to lisp their sire's return, or climb his knees the envied kiss to share. 
Oft did the harvest to their sickle yield. Their furrow oft the stubborn gleb has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield. How bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil. Their homely joys and destiny obscure. How grandeur here with a disdainful smile. The short and simple annals of the poor. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power. And all that beauty, all that wealth ever gave. A way to like the inevitable hour, the path of glory lead but to the grave. For you, ye proud, impute to these the fault, if memory over their tomb no trophies raise, where through the long-drawn island fretted vault, the pealing anthem swells the note of praise, can storied urn or animated bust, back to its mansion called the fleeting breath, can honour's voice provoke the silent dust, or flattery soothe the dull cold ear of death? Perhaps in this neglected spot is laid Some heart once pregnant with celestial fire Hands that the rod of empire might have swayed Awake to ecstasy the living liar But knowledge to their eyes her ample page Rich with spoils of time did never unroll Till penury repressed their noble rage And froze the genial current of the soul For many a gem of purest ray serene The dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear for many a flower is born to a blush unseen, and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Some village Hampden with sorry some village Hampden that with dauntless breast the little tyrant of his fields withstood, some mute inglorious Milton here may rest, some Cromwell guiltless of his country's blood, the applause of listening Senate to command, the threats of pain and ruin to despise, to scatter plenty over a smiling land and read their history in a nation's eyes. Their lot forbade nor circumscribed alone, their growing virtues but their crimes confined, forbade to wade the, through slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind, the struggled pangs of conscious trust to hide, to quench the blushes of ingenious shame or heap the shrine of luxury and pride with incense kindled at the muse's flame. Far from the maddening crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learned to stray. On the cool sequestered veil of life, they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. Yet even those bones from insult to protect, some frail memorial still erected nigh, with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. Their name, their years, spelt by the unlettered muse, the place of fame and elegy supply. And many a holy text around she strews that teach the rustic moralist to die. For who to dumb forgetfulness of prey, this pleasing anxious being ever resigned, left the warm precincts of the cheerful day, or cast one longing lingering look behind. On some fond breast the parting souls rely, some pious drops the closing eye requires. Even from the tomb the voice of nature cries, even in our ashes live their wonted fires. For thee who mindful of the unhonoured dead, dost in these lines their articles tale relate. If chance by lonely contemplation led, some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate. Haply some hoary-headed swain may say, oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn, brushing with hasty steps the dews away, to meet the sun upon the upland lawn. There at the foot of yonder nodding beech, that reefs its Old fantastic roots so high, its listless length at noontide would be stretched, and pour upon the brook that babbles by. Hard by yon wood now spy, smiling at, as in scorn, muttering his wayward fancies he would rove, now drooping woeful one, like one forlorn, or crazed with care, or crossed in hopeless love. One morn I missed him on the customed hill, along the heath and near his favourite tree. Never came, nor yet beside the rill, nor up the lawn, nor at the wood was he. And next with dirges due in sad array, slow through the church path we saw him borne, approaching reed, for thou canst read the lay, graved on the stone beneath you aged thorn. Uh. Yep, this is still part of the same poem. Here rests his head upon the lap of earth, a youth to fortune and to fame unknown, 
For science frowned not on his humble birth, and melancholy marked him for her own. Large was his bounty, and his soul sincere. Heaven did a recompense a largely send. Sorry, heaven did a recompense as largely send. He gave to misery all he had a tear. He gained from heaven, t'was all he wished a friend. No father seek his merits to disclose, or draw his frailties from their dread abode. There they alike in trembling hope repose, the bosom of his father and his god. Well, there was a lot to, uh... A lot to unpack there. I think I may actually uh, have a look at the uh, Wikipedia page now. Elegy written in a country uh, churchyard is a poem by Thomas Gray, completed in 1750 and first published in 1751. The poem's origins are unknown, but it was partly inspired by Gray's thoughts following the death of the poet Richard West in 1742. Mindful says, that's really good but dreadfully dense. I'd agree. This is uh, going to take a while, I think. Originally titled Stances Wrote in a Country Churchyard, the poem was completed when Gray was living near St. Giles Parish Church at Stoke Pogues. It was sent to his friend Horace Walpole, who popularised the poem among London literary circles. Gray was eventually forced to publish the work on the 15th of February 1751 in order to preempt a magazine publisher from, pr from printing an unlicensed copy of the poem. The poem is an elegy in name but not in form. It employs a style similar to that of contemporary odes but it embodies a meditation on death and remembrance after death. The poem argues that the remembrance can be good and bad and the narrator finds comfort in pondering the lives of the obscure rustics buried in the churchyard. The two versions of the poem, Stanzas and Elegy, approach death differently. The first contains a stoic response to death, but the final version contains an epitaph which serves to express the narrator's fear of dying. Claimed as probably still today the best known and best loved poem in English, the Elegy, the elegy quickly became popular. It was printed many times in a variety of formats, translated into many languages and praised by critics even after Gray's other poetry had fallen out of favour. But while many have continued to commend its language and universal aspects, some have felt that the ending is unconvincing, failing to resolve the questions raised by the poem in a way helpful to the obscure rustic poor who form its central image. Um, so we may as well read through this section as well. The poem begins in a church church of the speaker who is describing his surroundings in vivid detail. The speaker emphasizes both oral and visual sensations as he examines the area in relation to himself. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly over the lay. What was lay? I'm sure I've looked that one up before. An open field meadow. Uh, the ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air a solemn stillness holds. So if where the beetle wheels his droning flight and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Save that from yonder ivy mantle tower, the mooping hour does to the moon complain of such as wandering near his sacred bower, molest her ancient solitary reign. Uh, what's bower? Does that just mean bough as in a bough of a tree? Uh, a bedroom or private apartment, especially for women in medieval castles. A dwelling, a picturesque country cottage, especially one that is used as a retreat. A shady leafy uh, shelter or recess in a garden or woods. Uh, a large structure made of grass twigs, etc. and decorated with bright objects used by male bower birds during the courtship displays. Okay, so it's probably referring to a, um, a home. 
for a bird, I would assume. As the poem continues, the speaker begins to focus less on the countryside and more on his immediate surroundings. His descriptions move from sensations to his own thoughts as he begins to emphasise what is not present in the scene. He contrasts an obscure country life with a life that is remembered. The contemplation provokes the speaker's thoughts on the natural process of wastage and unfulfilled potential. Trying to match this up. They skipped a bit. There's those lines, and then the next. So ending on solitary rain, then it should be beneath those rugged elms. But here we've got for many a gem of purest ray serene. Yep, they've skipped a load. Um, for many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. For many a flower is born a blush unseen, and wastes its sweetness on the desert air. Some village Hamden. That with dauntless breast, the little tyrant of his fields was stood. Some mute and glorious Milton here may rest, some Cromwell guiltless of his country's blood. The applause of listening senate to command, the frets of pain and ruins to despise, to scatter plenty over a smiling land and read their history in a nation's eyes. Their lot forbade, or circumscribed alone, their growing virtues, but their crimes confined, forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne, and shut the gate of mercy on mankind. The, struggle, the struggling pangs of conscious truth to hide, to quench the blushes of in, ingenious shame, in, ingenuous shame, or heap the shrine of luxury and pride with incense kindled at the muse's flame. Um, yes, it says here lines 53 to 72, so it has skipped a bit. The speaker focuses on the inequities that come from death, obscuring individuals while he begins to resign himself to his own inevitable fate. As the poem ends, the speaker begins to deal with death in a direct manner as he discusses how humans desire to be remembered. As the speaker does so, the poem shifts and the first speaker is replaced by a second who describes the death of the first. Again, we've skipped a bit. For who, mindful of the unhonoured dead, dust in these lines their artless tale relate. relate. <laughs> if chance by lonely contemplation led, some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate. Haply some hoary-headed swain may say, oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn, brushing with hasty steps the dews away, to meet the sun upon the upland lawn. The poem concludes with a description of the poet's grave over which the speaker is meditating, together with a description of the end of the poet's life. There at the foot of yonder nodding beach that reefs its old fantastic root so high, his listless length at noontide would, be, would he stretch and pour upon the brook that pebbles by. Hard by yon wood, now spy, smiling, as in scorn, muttering his wayward fancies he would rove, how drooping woeful one, like one forlorn, or crazed with care, or crossed in hopeless love, one morn I missed him on the customed hill, along the heath, and near his favourite tree, another came, nor yet beside the rill, nor up the lawn, nor at the wood was he, the next with dirt is due in sad array, slow through the church way path, we saw him born, approach and read, for thou canst read the lay, graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn. An epitaph is included after the conclusion of the poem. The epitaph reveals that the poet whose grave is the focus of the poem was unknown and obscure. The circumstance kept the poet from becoming something greater, and he was separated from others because he was unable to join the common affairs of their life. He arrests, uh, and yeah, that follows immediately on. He rests his head upon the lap of earth, 
a youth to fortune and to fame unknown, her science frowned not on his humble birth, and melancholy marked him for her own. Large was his bounty, and his soul sincere, heaven did a recompense at, as largely send. He gave to misery all he had a tear, he gained from heaven, t'was all he wished a friend. No father seek his merits to disclose, or draw his frailties from their dread abode. There they alike in trembling hope repose, the bosom of his father and his god. The original conclusion from the earlier version of the poem confronts the reader with the inevitable prospect of death and advises resignation, which differs from the indirect third-person description in the final version. Uh, so this is from an earlier version, I assume. The thoughtless world to majesty may bow, exalt the brave and idolize success, but more to innocence their safety owe than power or genius ever conspired to bless. Oh, I do apologize, this should have been visible. And thou who mindst of thou unhonored dead, dost in these notes her artless tale relate, relate, by night and lonely contemplation led to wander in the gloomy walks of fate. Hark how the sacred calm that breaches around bids every fierce tumultuous passion cease. In still small accents whispering from the ground, a grateful earnest of eternal peace. No more with reason and thyself at strife, give anxious cares and endless wishes room, but through the cool sequestered veil of life pursue the silent tenure of thy doom. So yes, I'd agree, mindful it is very dense. Ah, that that shouldn't be lay, that should be Lee. So it rhymes with me. Day Lee Way Me. Sight flight holds folds. Tower bower complain rain. So we have an A B A B rhyming structure. Uh right, rhythm. Mindful says there's three to four stands are dedicated to each individual thought. Kind of crazy. It is certainly detailed, isn't it? I appreciate it, though. So it looks like... It's mostly ten syllables per line. don't think it's uh, it's um, iambic or with any other uh, specific s stress pattern
don't know, some lines read like they could be. But like here, the moping owl does to the moon complain. That doesn't work. So I don't think it is. Yeah, so I'm going to conclude that it isn't. But it is notable that the lines are ten syllables each. So, it's go so it is going to each... Um... So it is going to have a certain not quite a rhythm but there is going to be a certain timing to it and of course you've got the rhyming structure as well so I mean it's fairly complex in terms of its structure hmm to be honest, I feel like I could spend all of next week looking at this poem as well. Not sure if I will or not, but what I will do is I will give this one final reading now uh, before we move on. And uh, I will decide next week whether I want to go back and study this poem more or not. Uh, if there's anything in particular you would like to discuss about this poem, please put it in chat, and when I finish reading this again, I will check chat and discuss anything uh, that we'd like to discuss. So, elegy written in a country churchyard. The curfew tolls the knell of a part to Sorry, I've already <laughs> made a mistake. Let me start again. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lay. The lee. I'm so sorry. I'll stop. A third time. The curfew tells the knell of parting day. The lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lee. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight and all the air a solemn stillness holds. And save where the beetle wills his droning flight, and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. So from yonder ivy mantled tower, the moping owl does to the moon complain, of such as wandering near her sacred bower, secret bower, molest her ancient solitary reign, beneath those rugged elms that yew trees shade, where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap. Each in his narrow cell for ever laid the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep the breezy call of incense breathing morn the swallow twittering from the straw built shed the cock shrill clarion or the echoing horn no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed for them no more the blathing hearth shall burn or busy housewife ply her evening care no children run to lisp their sire's return or climb his knees the envied kiss to share Oft did the harvest to their sickle yield, their furrow oft the stubborn leap has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield, how bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure. Nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty, all that wealth ever gave, Await alike the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. For you, ye proud, impute these the fault. If memory over the tomb no trophies raise, where through the long drawn aisle and fretted vault, the pealing anthem swells the note of praise. 
can storied urn or animated bust back to its mansions call the fleeting breath can honor voice provoke the silent dust or flattery soothe the dull cold ear of death perhaps in his neglected spot is laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire hands that the rod of empire might have swayed or waked to ecstasy the living lyre but knowledge to their eyes her ample page rich with the spoils of time did never unroll till pen penury repressed their noble rage and froze the genial current of the soil but many a gem of purest race serene the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bare for many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness on the desert air some village hampton that with dauntless breast the little tyrant of his fields withstood some muting glorious milton here may rest some cromwell guiltless of his country's blood the applause of listening senate to command the threats of pain and ruin to despise to scatter plenty o'er a smiling land and read their history in a nation's eyes their lot forbade nor circumscribed alone their growing virtues but their crimes confined forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind the struggling pangs of conscious of conscious truth to hide to quench the blushes of ingenuous shame or heap this shrine of luxury and pride with incense kindled at the muses flame far from the maddening crowds in ignoble strife their sober wishes never learn to stray along the soul the cool sequestered veil of life they kept the noiseless tenure of their way yet even those bones from insult to protect some frail memorial still erected nigh with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked implores the passing tribute of a sigh their name their years spelt by the unlettered muse the place of fame and elegy supply and many a holy text around she strews that teach the rustic moralist to die for who to dumb forgetfulness a prey this pleasing anxious being ever resigned left the warm precincts of the cheerful day nor cast one longing lingering look behind on some fond breast the parting soul relies some pious drops the closing eye requires even from the tomb the voice of nature cries even in our ashes live the wanted fires for thee who mindful of thou unhonoured dead dost in these lines their artless tale relate if chance by lonely contemplation led some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate haply some hoary-headed swine may say oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn brushing with hasty steps the dews away to meet the sun upon the upland lawn there at the foot of yonder nodding beach the reefs its old fantastic root so high his listless length at noontide would he stretch and pour upon the brook that babbles by hard by yon wood now smiling, smiling as in scorn muttering his wayward fancies he would rove now drooping woeful wane like one forlorn or crazed with care or cross in hopeless love one morn i missed him on the customed hill along the heath and near his favourite tree another came nor yet beside the rill nor up the lawn nor at the wood was he the next with dirges due in sad array slow through the churchway path we saw him borne approach and read for thou canst read the lay graved on the stone beneath you aged thorn here rests his head upon the lap of earth a youth to fortunate and to fame unknown to fortune and to fame unknown fair science frowned not on his humble birth and melancholy marked him for her own large was his bounty and his soul sincere heavy did a recompense as largely send he gave to misery all he had a tear he gained from heaven twas all he wished a friend nor father seek his merits to disclose or draw his frailties from their dread abode there they alike in trembling hope repose the bosom of his father and his god So, uh, I think we'll stop there with the poetry today, and we will move on to Pride and Prejudice. Now to recap what happened in the last three chapters, in chapter 23, Sir William Lucas announced the marriage proposal between Mr. Collins and his daughter, 
Charlotte to the Bennet. Mrs. Bennet was then put into a pitiable state, uh, being uh, very upset that Elizabeth had lost her chance with Mr. Collins, and saying, and making all sorts of comments to Elizabeth over the coming weeks and months. As another side effect of this marriage proposal, Elizabeth feels she cannot confide in Charlotte ever again. She is so shocked by the revelation that she would be interested in marrying Mr. Collins that uh, she feels she um, can't really fully trust her anymore. And finally, there is no sign that Mr. Bin Bingley will be returning from London this winter. So it seems like the earlier letter they received was correct from Miss Bingley that they would be spending the winter in London. In chapter 24, Miss Bingley's letter, this is a new letter, confirms that they are already settled in London. Uh, subsequently, Mary and Elizabeth discussed Mr. Collins and Charlotte's engagement. In chapter 25, the gardeners visit the Bennets, where Mr. Gardner is Mrs. Bennett's brother. Mrs. Gardner invites Mary to stay with them uh, so that she can have a change of scene following the Mr. Bingley affair. Because, of course, they are. everyone is concerned that the growing romance between Mr. Bingley and um, just a second. Uh, I said Mary, didn't I? When I meant Jane, I apologise. Uh, sorry, so Mrs. Uh, Gardner invites Jane to stay with them so she can have a change of scene following the Mr. Bingley affair. Because, of course, everyone is concerned with um, Mr. Bingley disappearing like this, that the growing romance between them uh, is at a conclusion. Elizabeth and Mrs. Gardner, however, observe that because they live in a very different part of town, that is... They're in, they live in a, they're of a lower socio-economic status to Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy, so they live in a poorer part of town, that there is little hope of her either seeing Mr. Bingley by chance while she's staying with them, or of her wooing him, especially whilst Mr. Bingley is under the influence of the proud Mr. Darcy, who would presumably not want to see his friend lower himself as to visiting uh, Jane in that sort of part of town. So that's where we had gotten up to last week. Um, so, chapter 26. And if you have anything you want to discuss or anything like that, put it into chat. Obviously because I'm reading I won't be constantly looking back at chat, but I will occasionally look over and uh, reply. So, chapter 26. Mrs. Gardner's caution to Elizabeth was punctually and kindly given on the first favourable opportunity of speaking to her alone, after honestly telling her that she, what she thought. Uh, she thus went on. Um, specifically, this is referring to the fact that the officer, Mr. Wickham, had been visiting the Bennets and the... Gardeners at Longbourn House uh, for dinner and Mrs. Gardner had observed that Elizabeth and Mr. Wickham seemed to be getting along a little too well, although she didn't suspect that they were romantically involved. So that's specifically what it's referring to when it says Mrs. Gardner's caution to Elizabeth. You are too sensible a girl, Lizzie, to fall in love merely because you are warned against it, and therefore I am not afraid of speaking openly. Seriously, I would have you be on your guard. Do not involve yourself or endeavour to involve him in any effect in an affection which the want of fortune would make so, impru so very imprudent. I have nothing to say against him. He is a most interesting young man, and if he had the fortune he ought to have, 
I should think you could do could not do better. But as it is, you must not let your fancy run away with you. You have sense, and we all expect you to use it. Your father will depend on your resolution and good conduct, I am sure. You must not disappoint your father. My dear aunt, this is being serious indeed. Yes, and I hope to engage you to be serious likewise. Well then, you need not be under any alarm. I will take care of myself and of Mr. Wickham too. He shall not be in love with me if I can prevent it. Elizabeth, you are not serious now. I beg your pardon, I will try again. At present, I am not in love with Mr. Wickham. No, I certainly am not. But he is, beyond all comparison, the most agreeable man I ever saw. And if he becomes really attached to me, I believe it will be better that he should not. I see the, imprud the imprudence of it. Oh, that abominable Mr. Darcy. My father's opinion of me does me the greatest honour, and I should be miserable to forfeit it. My father, however, is partial to Mr. Wickham. In short, my dear aunt, I should be very sorry to be the means of making any of you unhappy, but since we see every day that where there is affection, young people are seldom withheld by immediate want of fortune from entering into engagements with each other, how can I promise to be wiser than so many of my fellow creatures if I am tempted? Or how am I even to know that it would be what wisdom to resist? All that I can promise you, therefore, is not to be in a hurry. I will not be in a hurry to believe myself his first object. When I, when I am in company with him, I will not be wishing. In short, I will do my best. Perhaps it will be as well if you discourage his coming here so very often. At least you should not remind your mother of inviting him. As I did the other day, said Elizabeth with a conscious smile. Very true, it will be wise in me to refrain from that. But do not imagine that he is always here so often. It is on your account that he has been so frequently invited this week. You know my mother's ideas as to the necessity of constant company for her friends. But really, and upon my honour, I will try to do what I think to be the wisest, and I hope you are satisfied. Her aunt assured her that she was, and Elizabeth having thanked her for the kindness of her hints, they parted. A wonderful instance of advice being given on such a point without being resented. Mr. Collins returned into Hertfordshire soon after it had been quitted by the gardeners and Jane. Uh, but as he took up his abode with the Lucases, his arrival was no great inconvenience to Mrs. Bennet. His marriage was now fast approaching, and she was at length so far resigned as to think it inevitable, and even repeatedly to say, in an ill-natured ill tone, that she wished they might be happy. Thursday was to be the wedding day, and on Wednesday Miss Lucas paid her farewell visit, and when she rose to take leave, Elizabeth, ashamed of her mother's ungraciousness and reluctant good wishes, and s sincerely affected herself, accompanied her hat accompanied her out of the room. As they went downstairs together, Charlotte said, I shall depend on hearing from you very often, Eliza. That you certainly shall. And I have another favour to ask you. Will you come and see me? We shall often meet, I hope, in Hertfordshire. I am not likely to leave Kent for some time. Promise me, therefore, to come hunt to Hunsford. Elizabeth could not refuse, so she saw little pleasure in the visit. My father and Maria are coming to me in March, added Charlotte and I hope you will consent to be of the party. Indeed, Eliza, you will be as welcome as either of them. The wedding took place. The bride and bridegroom set off for Kent from the church door, and everybody had as much to say or to hear on the subject as usual. Elizabeth soon heard from a friend, and their correspondence was as regular and frequent as it had ever been. That it should be equally unreserved was impossible. Elizabeth could never address her without feeling that all, all, the, without feeling that all the comfort of intimacy was over and though determined not to slacken as a correspondent, it was for the sake of what had been rather than what was. Charlotte's first letters were received with a good deal of eagerness. There could not be curiosity to know how she would speak of her new home, how she would like Lady Catherine, and how happy she would dare to pronounce herself to be, though when the letters were read, Elizabeth felt that Charlotte expressed herself on every point exactly as she might have foreseen. She wrote cheerfully, seemed surrounded with comforts, and mentioned nothing which she could not praise. The house, furniture, neighbourhood and roads were all to her taste, and Lady Catherine's behaviour was most friendly and obliging. It was Mr Collins' picture of Hunsford and Rosings rationally softened, and Elizabeth perceived that she must wait for her own visit there to know the rest. Jane had already written a few lines to her sister to announce her safe arrival in London when she wrote again. 
Elizabeth hoped it would be in her power to say something of the Binglers. Her impatience for this second letter was all well rewarded as impatience generally is. Jane had been a week in town without either seeing or hearing from Caroline. She accounted for it, however, by supposing that her last letter to her friend from Longbourn had by some accident been lost. My aunt, she continued, is going tomorrow into that part of, t of the town and I shall take the opportunity of calling in Grosvenor Street. She wrote again when the visit was paid and she had seen Miss Bingley. I do not think Caroline in spirits, were her words, but she was very glad to see me and reproached me for giving her no notice of my coming to London. I was right therefore. My last letter had never reached her, and quite after the brother of course. He was well, but so much engaged with Mr Darcy that they scarcely ever saw me. I found that Miss Darcy was expected to dinner. I wish I could see her. My visit was not long, as Caroline and Mrs Hurst were going out. I dare say I shall see them soon here. Elizabeth shook her head over this letter. It convinced her that the that accident only could discover to Mr Bingley her sister's being in town. Four weeks passed away and Jane saw nothing of him. She endeavoured to persuade herself that she did not regret it, but she could no longer be blind to Miss Bingley's inattention. After waiting at home every morning for a fortnight and inventing every evening a fresh excuse for her, the visit did at last appear, but the shortness of her stay and yet more the alteration of her manner would allow Jane to deceive herself no longer. The letter which she wrote on this occasion to her sister will prove what she felt. My dearest Lizzie will, I am sure, be incapable of triumphing in her better judgment at my expense when I confess myself to have been entirely deceived in Miss Bingley's regard for me. But my dear sister, though the event has proved you right, do not think me obstinate if I still assert that, considering what her behaviour was, my confidence was as natural as your suspicion. I do not at all comprehend a reason for wishing to be intimate with me, but if the same circumstances were to happen again, I am sure I should be deceived again. Caroline did not return my visit till yesterday, and not a note, not a line, did I receive in the meantime. When she did come, it was very evident that she had no pleasure in it. She made a slight formal apology for not coming before, said not a word of wishing to see me again, and was in every respect so altered a creature, that when she went away I was perfectly resolved to continue the acquaintance no longer. I pity, though I cannot help blaming her. She was very wrong in singling me out as she did. I can safely say that every advance to intimacy began on her side, but I pity her, because she must feel that she has been acting wrong, and because I am very sure that anxiety for her brother is the cause of it. I need not explain myself further, farther, um, and though we know this anxiety to be quite needless, yet if she feels it, it will easily account for her behaviour to me, and so deservedly dear as he is to her is to his sister, whatever anxiety she must feel on his behalf is natural and amiable. I cannot but wonder, however, at her having any such fears now, because if he had at all cared about me, we must have met long ago. He knows of my being in town, I am certain, from something she said herself, and yet it would seem, by her manner of talking, as if she wanted to persuade herself that he is really partial to Miss Darcy. I cannot understand it. If I were not afraid of judging harshly, I should be almost tempted to say that there is a strong appearance of duplicity in all this, but I will endeavour to banish every painful thought and think only of what will make me happy, your affection and the invariable kindness of my dear uncle and aunt. aunt. Let me hear from you very soon. Miss Bingley said something of his never returning to Neverfield again, of giving up the house, but not with any certainty. We had better not mention it. I am extremely glad that you have such pleasant accounts from our friends at Hunsford, Pray go to see them with Sir William and Maria. I'm sure you'll be very comfortable there. Yours, etc. The letter gave Elizabeth some pain, but her spirits returned as she considered that Jane would no longer be duped by the, by the sister at least. All expectation from the brother was now absolutely over. She would not even wish for a renewal of his attentions. His character sunk on every review of it and as punishment for him, as well as a possible advantage to Jane, she seriously hoped he might really soon marry Mr Darcy's sister, as by Wickham's account she would make him abundantly regret what he had thrown away. Mrs Gardiner about this time reminded Elizabeth of her promise concerning that gentleman, and required information. 
and Elizabeth had such to send as might rather give contentment to her aunt than to herself. His apparent partiality had subsided, his attentions were over, he was the admirer of someone else, Elizabeth was watchful enough to see it all, but she could see it and write of it without material pain. Her heart had been but slightly touched. Her vanity was satisfied with believing that she would have been his only choice had fortune permitted it. The sudden acquisition of £10,000 was the most remarkable charm of the young lady to whom he was now rendering himself agreeable, but Elizabeth, less close-sighted perhaps in this case than in Charlotte's, did not quarrel with him for his wish of independence. Nothing on the contrary could be more natural, and while able to suppose that it cost him a few struggles to relinquish her, she was ready to allow it a wise and desirable measure for both, and could very sincerely wish him happy. All this was acknowledged to Mrs. Gardiner, and after relating the circumstances, she thus went on, I am now convinced, my dear aunt, that I have never been much in love, for I had really experienced a pure and elevating passion I should at present detest his very name, and wish him all manner of evil, but my feelings are not only cordial towards him, they are even impartial towards Miss King. I cannot find out that I hate her at all, or that I am in the least unwilling to think her a very good sort of girl. There can be no love in all this. My watchfulness has been effectual, and though I certainly should be more interest interesting, and though I certainly should be a more interesting object to all my acquaintances were I distractedly in love with him, I cannot say I regret my comparative insignificance. Importance may sometimes be purchased too dearly. Kitty and Lydia take his defection much more to heart than I do. They are young in the ways of the world, and not yet open to the mortifying conviction that handsome young men must have something to live on as well as the plain. Chapter 27 With no greater events than these in the Longbond family, and otherwise diversified by little beyond the walks to Meryton, sometimes dirty and sometimes cold, did January and February pass away. March was to take Elizabeth to Huntford. She had not at first thought very seriously of going thither, but Charlotte, she, would so she soon found, was depending on the plan. Sorry, but Charlotte, she soon found, was depending on the plan, and she gradually leaned to consider it herself with greater pleasure as well as greater certainty. Absence had increased her desire of seeing Charlotte again, and weakened her disgust of Mr. Collins. There was novelty in the scheme. And as, with such a mother and such a uncompanionable sisters, home could not be faultless. A little change was not unwelcome for its own sake. The journey would moreover give her a peep at Jane, and in short, as the time drew near, she would be very sorry for any delay. Everything, however, went on smoothly and was finally settled according to Charlotte's first sketch. She was to accompany Sir William and his second daughter, the improvement of spending a night in London was added in time, and the plan became perfect as plan could be. And the plan became perfect as plan. Yeah, that is what it says. And the plan became perfect as plan could be. I assume that should be as a plan could be. The only pain was in leaving her father, who would certainly miss her, and who, when it came to the point, so little liked her going that he told her to write to him and almost promised to answer her letter. The farewell between herself and Mr. Wickham was perfectly friendly, on his side even more. His present pursuit could not make him forget that Elizabeth had been the first to excite and to deserve his attention, the first to listen and to pity, and first to be admired, and in his manner of bidding her adieu, wishing her every enjoyment, reminding her of what she was to expect in Lady Catherine de Burr, and trusting their opinion of her, their opinion of everybody, would always coincide. There was a solicitude, an interest which she felt must ever attach her to him with a most sincere regard, and she parted from him convinced that, whether married or single, he must always be her model of the amiable and pleasing. Her fellow travellers the next day were not of a kind to make her think him less agreeable. Sir William Lucas and his daughter Maria, a good-humoured good girl, but as empty-headed as himself, and nothing to say that could be worth hearing, and were listened to with as much delight as the rattle of the sh chase. The chase being the... it's a type of... Um, oh, what's it called? Not cart. No, it would be a cart, wouldn't it? But for carrying people. Um, 
as in a horse and cart. In fact, I dare say I could find a picture of one on Wikipedia. A chase. Uh, anyway. Um, So William Lucas and his daughter Maria are a good humoured girl but as empty headed as himself had nothing to say that could be worth hearing and were listened to with as much delight as the rattle of the chase. Elizabeth loved absurdities but she had known Sir Williams too long. He could tell her nothing new of the wonders of his presentation and knighthood and his civilities were worn out like his information. It was a journey of only 24 miles and they began it so early as to be in, in Grace Church Street by noon. As they drove to Mr. Gardiner's door, Jane was at a drawing room window watching their arrival. When they entered the passage, she was there to welcome them, and Elizabeth, looking earnestly in her face, was pleased to see it healthful and as lovely as ever. The stairs were a troop of on the stairs were a troop of little boys and girls whose eagerness for their cousin's appearance would not allow them to wait in the drawing room, and whose shyness, as they had not seen her for a twelfth month prevented their coming lower. All was joy and kindness. The day passed most pleasantly away, the morning in bustle and shopping, and the evening at one of the theatres. Elizabeth then contrived to sit by her aunt. Her first object was her sister, and she was more grieved than astonished to hear, in reply to her minute inquiries, that though Jane always struggled to support her spirits, there were periods of dejection. It was reasonable, however, to hope that there they would not continue long. Mrs. Gardner gave her the particulars also of Miss Bingley's visit in Grace Church Street, and repeated conversations occurring at different times between Jane and herself, which proved that the former had, from her heart, given up the acquaintance. Mrs. Gardner then rallied her niece on Wickham's desertion, and complimented her on bearing it so well. But my dear Elizabeth, she added, what sort of girl is Miss King? I should be sorry to think our friend mercenary. Pray, my dear aunt, what is the difference in matrimonial affairs between the mercenary and the prudent motive? Where does discretion end and avarice begin? Last Christmas you were afraid of his marrying me, because it would be imprudent. And now, because he is trying to get a girl with only £10,000, you want to find out that he is mercenary? If you will only tell me what sort of girl Miss King is, I shall know what to think. She is a very good kind of girl, I believe. I know no harm of her. But he paid her not the smallest attention till her grandfather's death made her mistress of this fortune. No, why should he? If it were not allowable for him to gain my affections because I had no money, what occasion could there be for making love uh, to a girl whom he did not care about, and who was equally poor? Uh, but there seems an indecency in directing his attentions towards her so soon after his event. A man in distressed circumstances has not time for all these elegant decorums which other people may observe. If she does not object to it, why should we? Her not objecting does not justify him. It only shows her being deficient in something herself, sense or feeling. Well, cried Elizabeth, have it as you choose. He shall be mercenary and she shall be foolish. No, Lizzie, that is what I do not choose. I should be sorry, you know, to think ill of a young man who has lived so long in Derbyshire. Oh, if that is all, I have a very poor opinion of young men who live in Derbyshire, and their intimate friends who live in Hertfordshire are not so much better. I'm sick of them all. Thank heaven, I am going tomorrow where I shall find a man who has not one agreeable quality, who has neither manner nor sense to recommend him. Stupid men are the only ones worth knowing, after all. Take care, Lizzie, that speech savours strongly of disappointment. Before they were separated by the conclusion of the play, she had the, she had the expected unhappy. Sorry, she had the unexpected happiness of an invitation to accompany her uncle and aunt in a tour of pleasure which they proposed taking in the summer. We've not determined how far it shall carry, said Miss, Mrs. Gardiner, but perhaps to the lakes. No scheme could have been more agreeable to Elizabeth, and her acceptance of the invitation was most ready and grateful. Oh, my dear, dear aunt, she raptured, rapturously cried. What delight, what felicity. You give me fresh life and vigour, a due to disappointment and spleen. What a young man of rocks and mountains. Oh, what hours of transport we shall spend. And when we do return, it shall not be like other travellers. 
without being able to give one accurate idea of anything. We will know what we have gone. We will recollect what we have seen. Lakes, mountains and rivers shall not be jumbled together in our imaginations. Nor when we attempt to describe any particular scene will we begin quarrelling about its relative situation. Let, let our first effusions be less insupportable than those of the generality of travellers. Chapter 28 Every object in the next day's journey was new and interesting to Elizabeth, and her spirits were in a state of enjoyment, for she had seen her sister looking so well as to banish all fear for her health, and the prospect of her northern tour was a constant source of delight. When they left the high road for the lane to Hunsford, every eye was in search of the parsonage, and every turning expected to bring it in view. The palings of Rosings Park was a was their boundary on one side. Elizabeth smiled at the recollection of all that she had heard of its inhabitants. At length the parsonage was discernible, the garden sloping to the road, the house standing in it, the green pales on the laurel hedge, everything declared they were arriving. Mr. Collins and Charlotte appeared at the door, and the carriage stopped at the small gate which led by a short gravel walk to the house, amidst the nods and smiles of the whole party. In a moment they were all out of the chase, rejoicing at the sight of each other. Mrs. Collins welcomed her friend with the liveliest pleasure, and Elizabeth was more and more satisfied was more and more satisfied with coming when she found herself so affectionately received. She saw instantly that her cousin's manners were not altered by his marriage. His formal civility was just what it had been, and he detained her some minutes at the gate to hear and satisfy his inquiries after all her family. They were then, with no other delay than his pointing out the neatness of the entrance, taken into the house, and as soon as they were in the parlour he welcomed them a second time, with ostentatious formality in his humble abode, and punctually repeated all his wife offers of refreshment. Elizabeth was prepared to see him in his glory, and she could not help in fancying that in displaying the good proportions of the room, its aspect and its furniture, he addressed himself particularly to her, as if wishing to make her feel what she had lost in refusing him. But though everything seemed neat and comfortable, she was not able to gratify him by any sign of repentance, and rather looked with wonder at her friend that she could have so cheerful an air with such a companion. When Mr. Collins said anything which his wife might reasonably be ashamed, which certainly was not unseldom, she involuntarily turned her eye on Charlotte. Once or twice she could discern a faint blush, but in general Charlotte wisely did not hear. After sitting long enough to admire every article of furniture in the room, from the sideboard to the fender, Ooh, a fender. What is a fender? Uh, a low metal framework in front of a fireplace intended to catch hot coals, soot and ash. Ah, oh, so presumably. Uh, that's a fender at the bottom of the background. I just didn't know the name. After sitting long enough to admire every article of furniture in the room, from the sideboard to the fender, to give an account of their journey and of all that had happened in London, Mr. Collins invited them to take a stroll in the garden, which was large and well laid out, and to the cultivation of which he attended himself. To work in this garden was one of his most respectable pleasures, and Elizabeth admired the command of continence with which Charlotte talked of the healthfulness of the exercise, and owned she encouraged it as much as possible. Here, leading the way through every walk and crosswalk, and scarcely allowing them an interval to utter the praises he asked for, Every view was pointed out with a minuteness which left beauty entirely behind. He could number the fields in every direction, and he could tell how many trees there were in the most distant clump. But of all the views which his garden, or which the country or kingdom could boast, none were to be compared with the prospect of rosings, afforded by an opening in the trees that bordered the park nearly opposite the front of his house. It was a handsome modern building, well situated on rising ground. From his garden, Mr. Collins uh, would have led them round his two meadows, 
but the ladies, not having shoes to encounter the remains of a white frost, turned back, and while Sir William accompanied him, Charlotte took her sister and friend over the house. Extremely well pleased, probably to have the opportunity of showing it without her husband's help, it was rather small but well built and convenient, and everything was fitted in a range of a neatness and consistency of which Elizabeth gave Charlotte all the credit. When Mr. Collins could be forgotten, there was really an air of great comfort throughout, and Charlotte evident and Charlotte's evident enjoyment of it, Elizabeth supposed he must be often forgotten. She had already learnt that Lady Catherine was still in the country. It was spoken of again while they were at dinner, and when Mr. Collins joining in observed, Yes, Miss Elizabeth, you will have the honour of seeing Lady Catherine de Burr on the ensuing Saturday at, uh, sorry, on the ensuing Sunday at church, and I need not say you will be, like, be delighted with her. She is all affability and condescension, and I doubt not but you will be honoured with some portion of her notice when the service is over. I have scarcely any hesitation in saying she will include you and my sister Maria in every invitation with which she honours us during your stay here. Her behaviour to my dear Charlotte is charming. We dine at Rosings twice every week and are never allowed to walk home. Her ladyship's carriage is regularly ordered for us. I should say one of her ladyship's carriages, for she has several. Lady Catherine is a very respectable, sensible woman indeed, added Charlotte, and a most attentive neighbour. Very true, my dear. That is exactly what I say. She is the sort of woman whom one cannot regard with too much deference. The evening was spent chiefly in talking over Hertfordshire news and telling again what had already been written, and when it closed, Elizabeth, in the solicitude of her chamber, had meditated upon Charlotte's degree of contentment to understand her addressing, guiding, and composure in bearing with her husband, and to acknowledge it was all done very well. She had also to anticipate how her visit would pass, the quiet tenor of their usual employments, the vexatious interruptions of Mr. Collins, and the gaieties of their intercourse with Rosings. A lively imagination soon settled it all. About the middle of the next day, as she was in her room getting ready for a walk, a sudden noise below seemed to speak the whole house in confusion, and after a listening moment she heard somebody running up the stairs in a violent hurry, and called la loudly after her. She opened the door and met Maria in the landing place, who breathless with agitation cried out, Oh my dear Eliza, pray make haste and come into the dining room, for there is such a sight to be seen. I'll not tell you what it is. Make haste and come down this moment. Elizabeth asked questions in Mar <clears throat> sorry, Elizabeth asked questions in vain. Maria, Maria would tell her nothing more, and down they ran into the dining dining My apologies. And down they ran into the dining room, which fronted the lane in quest of this wonder. It was two ladies stop stoop it was two ladies stopping in a low phaeton at the garden gate. And is this all? cried Elizabeth. I expect at least that pigs were got into the garden, and here is nothing but Lady Catherine and her daughter. La, my dear, said Maria, quite shocked at the mistake. It's not Lady Catherine. The old lady is Mrs. Jenkinson, who lives with them. The other is Mr. Burr. Only look at her. She is quite a little creature. Who would have thought that she could be so thin and small? She is abominably rude to keep Charlotte out of doors in all this wind. Why does she not come in? Oh, Charlotte says she hardly ever does. It is the greatest favours when Mr. Burr comes in. I like her appearance, said Elizabeth, struck with her ideas. She looks sickly and cross, yet she will do for him very well. She will make him a very proper wife. Mr. Collins and Charlotte were both... That being Mr. Darcy. Uh, Mr. Collins and Charlotte were both standing at the gate in conversation with the ladies, and Sir William, to Elizabeth's high diversion, was stationed in the doorway, in earnest, in earnest contemplation of the greatness before him, and constantly bowing whenever Mr. Burr looked that way. At length there was nothing more to be said. The ladies drove on, and the others returned into the house. Mr. Collins no sooner saw the two girls than he began to congratulate them on their good fortune, which Charlotte explained by letting them know that the whole party was asked to dine at Rosings the next day. Chapter 29 Mr. Collins' triumph in the consequence of this invitation was complete. The power of displaying the grandeur of his patroness to his wandering visitors and of letting them see his civility toward 
sorry, and letting them see her civility towards himself and his wife was exactly what he had wished for, and that an opportunity of doing it should be given so soon was such an instance of Lady Catherine's condescension as he knew not how to admire enough. I confess, said he, that I should not have been at all surprised by her ladyship's asking us on Sunday to drink tea and spend the evening at Rosings. I rather expected from my knowledge of her affability that it would happen, but who could have foreseen such attention as this? Who could have imagined that she should receive an invitation to dine there, an invitation, moreover, including the whole party, so immediately after your arrival? I am the less surprised at what has happened, replied Sir William, from that knowledge of what the manners of the great really are, which my situation in life has allowed me to acquire, about the court, such instances of elegant breeding are not uncommon. Scarcely anything was talked of the whole day or next morning but their visit to Rosings. Mr. Collins was carefully instructing them in what they were to expect, what the sight of such rooms, so many servants, and so splendid a dinner, might not wholly overpower them. When the ladies were separating from the toilet, he said to Elizabeth, Do not make yourself uneasy, my dear cousin, about your apparel. Lady Catherine is far from requiring that ele elegance of dress in us which becomes herself and her daughter. I would advise you to I advise you merely to put on whatever of your clothes is superior to the rest. There is no occasion for anything more. Lady Catherine will not think the worse of you for being simply dressed. She likes to have the distinction of rank preserved. While they were dressing, he came two or three times to their different doors to recommend their being quick, as Lady Catherine very much objected to being kept waiting for her dinner. Such formid formidable accounts of her ladyship and a manner of living quite frightened Maria Lucas, who had been little used to company, and she looked forward to her introduction at Rosings with as much apprehension as her father had done to his presentation at St. James. As the weather was fine, they had a pleasant walk of about half a mile across the park. Every park has its beauty and its prospects, and Elizabeth saw much to be pleased with. Though she could not be in such raptures as Mr. Collins expected the scene to inspire, and was but slightly affected by its enumeration of the windows in front of the house, and his relation of what the glazing altogether had originally cost Sir Louis de Burr, when they ascended the steps to the hall, Maria, Maria's alarm was every moment increasing, and even Sir William did not look perfectly calm. Elizabeth's courage did not fail her. She had heard nothing of Lady Kevering that spoke her awful from any extraordinary talents or, mirac or miraculous virtue. Uh, and the mere stateliness of money or rank she thought she could witness without trepidation. From the entrance hall, of which Mr. Collins pointed out with a rapturous air, the fine proportion and the finished ornaments, they followed the servants through an antechamber to the room where Lady Catherine, her daughter, and Mrs. Jenkins were sitting. Her ladyship, with great condescen condescension, arose to receive them, and Mrs. Collins had settled in with her husband that the office of... Sorry. And as Mrs. Collins had settled it with her husband that the office of introduction should be hers, it was performed in a proper manner, without any of those apologies and thanks which he would have thought necessary. In spite of having been at St. James, Sir Ridian was so completely awed by the grandeur surrounding him, that he had but just courage enough to make a very lowly bow, a very low bow, and take his seat without saying a word, and his daughter, frightened almost out of her senses, sat on the edge of her chair, not knowing which way to look. Elizabeth found herself quite equal to the scene, and could observe the three ladies before her composedly. Lady Catherine was a tall, large woman, with strong features, which might once have been handsome. Her air was not conciliating, nor was her manner of receiving them such as to make her visitors forget their inferior rank. She was not rendered formidable by silence, but whatever she said was spoken in so authoritative a tone as marked her self-importance and brought Mr. Wickham immediately, immediately to Elizabeth's mind, and from the observation of the day altogether, she believed Lady Catherine to be exactly what he represented. When after examining the mother, in whose countenance and deportment she soon found some resemblance of Mr. Darcy, she turned her eyes on the daughter, 
She could almost have joined in Maria's astonishment at her being so thin and small. And so small. There was neither in figure nor face any likeness between the ladies. Mr. Burr was pale and sickly. Her features, though not plain, were insignificant. And she spoke very little, except in a low voice. To Mrs. Jenkins, in whose appearance there was nothing remarkable, and who was entirely engaged in listening to what she said, and placing a scene in the proper direction before her eyes. Also, and placing a screen in the proper direction towards her eyes. Uh, I'm not sure what that what they mean by placing a screen. I wonder if that's um, similar to a fan, as in a hand fan that an elegant woman might be holding. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll have a quick look to see if. Wiktionary has any ideas? Doesn't look like it. I'll quickly check my physical dictionary since I have it here. Any object utilised as shelter, especially from observation, expression of face, or measure adopted for concealment, protection afforded by these. Yep, I can't find an exact explanation. So my best guess, guess is that it's something like a fan that she's using to screen her face with. Um, Sorry, um... Ah, I was right at the top. Uh, Mrs. Jenkins, in whose appearance there was nothing remarkable, and who was entirely engaged in listening to what she said, that being Mr. Burr, and placing a screen in the proper direction before her eyes. After sitting a few minutes, they were all sent to one of the windows to admire the view. Mr. Collins attending them to the point out its <coughs> sorry. Mr. Collins attending them to point out its beauties and Lady Catherine kindly informing them that it was much better worth looking at in the summer. The dinner was exceedingly handsome, and there were all the servants and all the articles of plate which Mr. Collins had promised, and as he had likewise foretold, he took his seat at the bottom of the table by her ladyship's desire and looked as if he felt that life could furnish nothing greater. He carved and ate and praised with delighted alacrity, and every dish was commended, first by him and then by Sir William, who was now enough recovered to echo whatever his son-in-law said, in a manner which Elizabeth wondered Lady Catherine could bear. But Lady Catherine seemed gratified by their excessive admiration, and gave most gracious smiles, especially when any dish on the table proved a novelty to them. The party did not supply much conversation. Elizabeth was ready to speak whenever there was an opening, but she was seated between Charlotte and Mr. Burr, 
the former of whom was engaged in listening to Lady Catherine, and the latter said not a word to her all dinner time. Mrs. Jenkinson was chiefly employed in watching how little Mr. Burr ate, pressing her to try some other dishes, and fearing she was indisposed. Maria thought speaking out of the question, uh, and the gentleman did nothing but eat and ad and the gentleman did nothing but eat and admire. I feel like they mean something specific when they say indisposed. Mildly ill. So, yeah, I suppose that's all they mean. When the ladies returned to the drawing room, there was little to be done but to hear Lady Catherine talk, which she did without any intermission till coffee came in delivering her opinion on every subject in so decisive a manner as proved that she was not used to have her judgment controverted. She inquired into Charlotte's domestic concerns, familiarity and minutely, gave her a great deal of advice as to the management of them all, told her how everything ought to be regulated in so small a family as hers, and instructed her as to the care of her cows and poultry. Elizabeth found that nothing was beneath this great lady's attention, which could furnish her with an occasion of dictating to others. Uh, in the intervals of her discourse with Mrs. Collins, she addressed a variety of questions to Maria and Elizabeth, but especially to the latter, of whose connections she knew the least, and who she observed to Mrs. Collins was a very genteel, pretty kind of girl. She asked her at different times how many sisters she had, whether they were older or younger than herself, whether any of them were likely to be married, whether they were handsome, where they had been educated, and what carriage her father kept, and what had been her mother's maiden name. Elizabeth felt all the impertinence of her questions, but answered them very composedly. Lady Catherine then observed, Your father's estate is entailed to Mr. Collins, I think, for your sake. Turning to Charlotte, I'm glad of it but otherwise I see no occasion for entailing estates from the female line. It was not thought necessary in Sir Louis de Burr's family. Do you play and sing, Miss Bennet? Little? Oh! Then sometime or other we shall be happy to hear you. Our instrument is a capital one, probably superior to... You shall try it some day. Do your sisters play and sing? One of them does. Why did not you all learn? You ought to... You ought all to have learned. The Miss Webbs all play. And their father has not so good an income as yours. Do you draw? No, not at all. What? None of you? Not one. This is very strange. But I suppose you had no opportunity. Your mother should have taken you to town every spring for the benefit of masters. Your mother would have would have had no objection, but my father hates London. Um, that is, of course, what they mean by taking you to town, going to London. Has your governess left you? We never had any governess. No governess? How is that possible? Five daughters brought up at home without a governess? I never heard of such a thing. Your mother must have been quite a slave to your education. Elizabeth could hardly help smiling as she assured her that she had not that this had not been the case. Then who taught you? Who attended you? Without a governess you must have been neglected. Compared with some families I believe we were, but such of us had wished to learn never wanted the means. We were always encouraged to read and all the masters that were necessary. Those who chose to be idle certainly might. I, no doubt, but that is what a governess will prevent, and if I had known your mother, I should have advised her most strenuously to engage one. I always say that nothing is to be done in education without steady and regular instruction, and nobody but a governess can give it. It is a wonderful how many families I have been the means of supplying in that way. I am always glad to get, get a young person well placed out, Four nieces of Mrs. Jenkins are most delightfully situated through my means, and it was but the other day that I recommended another young person, who was merely accidentally mentioned to me, and the family are quite delighted with her. Mrs. Collins, did I tell you of Lady Macaus calling yesterday to thank me? She finds Miss Pope a treasure. Lady Catherine, said she, you have given me a treasure. Are any of your younger sisters out, Miss Bennet? Yes, ma'am, all. All? What, all five out at once? Very odd. And you, only the second? The younger one's out before the elder ones are married. Your younger sisters must be very young. Yes, my youngest is not sixteen. Perhaps she is full young to be in much company. 
Sorry. Perhaps she is full young to be much in company. But really, ma'am, I think it would be very hard upon younger sisters that they should not have their share of society and amusement, because the elder may not the means or inclination to marry early. The last born has a, as good a right to the pleasures of youth as the first, and to be kept back on such a motive, I think it would not be very likely to promote sisterly affection or delicacy of mind. Upon my word, said her ladyship, you give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. Pray, what is your age? With three younger sisters grown up, replied Elizabeth, smiling, smiling. Your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it. Lady Catherine seemed quite astonished at not receiving a direct answer, and Elizabeth suspected her to be the first creature who had ever dared trifle with so much dignified impertinence. You cannot be more than twenty, I am sure. Therefore, you need not conceal your age. I am not one and twenty. When the gentleman had joined them, and tea was over, the card tables were placed. Lady Catherine, Sir William, and Mr. and Mrs. Collins sat down to quadrille, and as Mr. Bird chose to play at casino, the two, girl, the, <clears throat> the two girls had the honour of assisting Mrs. Jenkinson to make up her party. The table was superlatively stupid. Scarcely a syllable was uttered that did not relate to the game, except when Mrs. Jenkinson expressed her fears of Mr. Bird being too hot or too cold, or having too much or too little light. A great deal more passed at the other table. Lady Catherine was generally, was generally speaking, staking, stating the mistakes of the three others, or relating some anecdote of herself. Mr. Collins was employed in agreeing to everything her ladyship said, thanking her for every fish he won, and apologising if he thought he won too many. Sir William did not say much. He was storing his memory with anecdotes and noble names. When Lady Catherine and her daughter had played as long as they chose, the tables were broken up, the carriage was offered to Mrs. Collings, gratefully accepted and immediately ordered. The party then gathered around the fire to hear Lady Catherine determine what weather they were to have on the morrow. From these instructions they were summoned by the arrival of the coach, with many speeches of thankfulness on Mr. Collins' side, and as many bows on Sir William's they departed. As soon as they had driven from the door, Elizabeth was called on by her cousin to give her opinion all that she had seen at Rosings, which, for Charlotte's sake, she made more favourable than it really was. But accommodation, though costing her some trouble, could by no means satisfy Mr. Collins, and he was very soon obliged to take a ladyship's praise into his own hands. So, um, that will do for the Pride and Prejudice this week. If there's anything anyone in chat would like to discuss about it, please put it into chat. Um, and otherwise, we shall move on to the riddles. Oh goodness me, I forgot to change the scene. So, I think think the last riddle we looked at last week or the final riddle we looked at last week was 60 since Diogenes time I'm the best habitation that ever was contrived by a civilized nation yet through regions so distant no mortal ever strolled for I visit all nations between the two poles uh, and I may be misremembering, but I think the solution was a a barrel because Diogenes famously lived in a barrel. That is the ancient Greek philosopher. Oh, a ship. Nope, I was well off then. Shows how reliable my memory is.
Uh, he slept in a large ceramic jar or pithos, and that's sometimes represented as a barrel. Um, but the solution to that riddle was a ship. So I was wrong. Anyway. Riddle 61. Four things there are, all of a height, one of them crooked, the rest upright. Take three away and you will find exactly ten remain behind. But if you cut the four in twain, you'll find one half doth eight retain. Four things there are, all of a height, one of them crooked, the rest upright. Take three away and you will find exactly ten remain. But if you cut the four in twain, you'll find one half doth eight remain. sounds almost like Roman numerals, doesn't it? But it doesn't quite add up. Or doesn't quite figure. Four things that are all of a height, one of them crooked, the rest upright. See, that would make sense if there were four uprights of a height, and then a fifth one that was crooked, because then that would make the Roman numeral five. Take three away and you will find exactly ten remain behind. That would be taking away three of the uprights to make the Roman numeral something close to the Roman numeral ten. But if you cut the four and twain you will find one half to eight retain. I don't think that can be it. I mean I was thinking then, you know, like if you you could then have eight uprights if you basically cut away at the crooked one, removed it and cut at that point, but that doesn't quite figure. Oh, thank you, Mindful. I'm not thinking of Roman numerals, am I? I'm confusing Roman numerals and tallies. That's That explains the inconsistency.
four things that are all of a height, one of them crooked, the rest are bright. Take three away and you will find exactly ten remain. But if you count the four and twain, you will find one half does eight retain. It does sound almost like it is some way of writing down numbers though. It can't be a tally, because then you'd have five things. I don't think it could be Roman numerals either. Mindful it says beats me. Okay, let's look this one up then. Uh, I wondered if it could be the Roman numeral 13, because they said take away 3 and 10 remains. But the reason I dismissed that is because I would argue that two of the lines are crooked. Not just one of them. But it does make sense that if you take away the bottom half of the 10, then you end up with 8 remaining, which perhaps I should have spotted. Four things there are, all of a height, one of them crooked, the rest upright. Oh, because there's four characters. There's um, an X, and then there's the three I's. And they're all of the same height, as you can see up here, but one of them's crooked, that being the X. Take away, uh, take three away, and you will find exactly ten remain behind. That makes sense. But if you cut the four in twain, you'll find one half of eight retain. If you cut all four characters in half, the eyes remain the same. They're still eyes, but the X becomes a V. Okay. So that that makes sense in retrospect.
Um, 62. From the third Henry's reign, I my pred pedigree trace, though some will contend that more ancient's my race, but in those early days my importance was small, I never came by chance but obeyed others' call. Now so willing am I, no entreaties I need, but I tremble and fear lest I should not succeed. I'm a mere human creature like you or another, but to form me requires neither father nor mother. And what is more strange, I have often a brother. I was born among riot, tumult and noise of a numerous family, most of them boys. We are none of us dumb, some of language profuse, but two words are as many as most of us use. A little, one little hint further to give, I think fit, we all of us stand before we can sit. I'm wondering if this refers to some form of society or station or group or something like that. From the third Henry's reign, my predigree trace, that would make sense if this was, you know, like a, a order of knights, for example. Though some will contend that more ancient's my race. But in those early days, my importance was small. I never came by chance, but obeyed others' call. Now so willing am I, no entreaties I need. That that all could make sense. This could be something like an order of knights, or it could be a... A... What's the word? An institution? I know this... I know the thing I'm about to suggest isn't the answer... But like, for example, judges, you could, you could un imagine how, you know, they may have had a very small role to play in early days and then it became much larger. It's not judges. Judges are far more ancient than that. But that's the sort of thing I'm thinking. Um... But I tremble in fear lest I should not succeed. I'm a mere human creature like you or another, but to form me requires neither father nor mother. That would make sense if you become one of these in your life. You aren't born one, you become one. And what is more strange, I have often a brother. I was born among riot, turmoil and noise. That's what makes me think there could be some connection to either war or civil unrest so something like a bailiff Or perhaps a, a specific type of military role. We are none of us dumb, some of language profuse, but two words are as many of most of us use. One little hint further to give, I think, we all of us stand before we can sit. Again, that makes me think that they might be sitting in judgment or something like that. Mindful says, yeah, but so many groups could uh, fall under that then. In principle, but I'm assuming 
hints like we all of us stand before we can sit is supposed to narrow it down a lot. A barrister? Though don't you cross the bar, not stand. You don't stand at court, you cross the bar. Um, something like that. I mean, I could just look up Henry the Third. See what, if anything, that gets us. Uh, Henry the Third of England. Henry of Winchester. Son of King John and Isabella of Ango Angoulême. I I'm, I'm butchering that. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Henry assumed the throne when he was only nine, in the middle of the First Barons' War. Uh, Cardinal Guala declared the war against the rebel barons to be a religious crusade, and Henry's forces, led by William Marshall defeat the rebels at the Battle of Lincoln and Sandwich. Henry promised to abide by the Great Charter. Oh, this is Magna Carta. Ooh. That is a... That feels like a massive hint. Which limited royal power and protected the rights of major barons. His early rule was dominated by Hubert de Burr. And then Peter de Rocher, who established royal authority after the war. In 1230, the king attempted to reconquer the preferences of France that had once belonged to his father, but the invasion was a debacle. A revolt led by William Marshall's son, Richard Marshall, broke out in 1232, ending in a peace settlement negotiated by the church. Uh, following the revolt, Henry ruled England personally rather than governing through senior ministers. He travelled less than previous monarchs, investing heavily in a handful of his favourite palaces and castles. He married Eleanor of, of Pro, uh, Provence, with whom he had five children. Henry became known for his piety, holding lavish religious ceremonies and giving generously to charities. The king was particularly devoted to the figure of Edward the Confessor, whom he adopted as his patron saint took a huge sums of money from the Jews in England, ultimately crippling their ability to do business, and as attitudes towards the Jews hardened, he introduced the Statue of Jewry, attempting to segregate the community. In a fresh attempt to reclaim his family's land in France, he invaded Poitou in 1242, leading to the disastrous Battle of Tal Talbor. I must be butchering that as well. After this, Henry relied on diplomacy, cultivating an alliance with Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor. Henry supported his brother Richard of Cornwall in his bid to become King of the Romans in 1256, but was unable to place his own son Edmund Crouchback at the throne of Sicily. Despite investing large amounts of money, he planned to go on a crusade to the Levant, but was prevented from doing so by rebellions in Gascony. By 1658 Henry was increasing in popular could it be members of parliament I'm tr I don't know when parliament was established but I wouldn't be surprised if that was established after Magna Carta that would make some sense from the third Henry's reign I'm a pedigree trace though some will contend more ancient my race but in those early days my importance was small Never came by chance, but paid off a school. Now so willing am I, no entreaties I need. Could it be Parliament itself, a parliamentary session? Because it used to be the case that they did have to be called. 
but then by the point this was written they were regular because um, of course this is well past the Civil War um, I don't know what point they came regular they were certainly a regular thing during and after the Civil War whether the, that change happened earlier I'm not sure but that's not relevant but I tremble in fear lest I should not succeed I am a human creature like you or another but to form me requires neither father nor mother and what is more strange I often I have often a brother I was born, born among riot and tumult and noise of a numerous family most of them boys we are none of us dumb some, la some of language profuse but two words are as many as most of us use one little hint further to give I think we all stand before we can sit I I really feel like that's related to Parliament in some way. I just can't quite get there. Um, where was I? Uh, by 1258, Henry's rule was increasing in popular as a result of the failure of his expensive foreign policies and the notoriety. Uh, Mindful says this makes sense with the last line, since they have to stand for the, uh, for the judge before being seated. Uh, do you mean the Speaker of the House of Commons, or are you referring to um, someone I'm not familiar with? Uh, as well as the role of his local officials in collecting taxes and debts, a coalition of his parents initially probably backed by Eleanor C. Parano coup d'etat and expelled the Potovans from England reforming the royal government through a process called the Provisions of Oxford. Henry and the baronial government enacted a peace with France in 1259 under which Henry gave up his rights to his other lands in France in return for King Louis the Ninth recognising him as the rightful ruler of Gascony. The baronial regime collapsed but Henry was unable to reform a stable government and instability across England continued. Yes. Um, Mindful said, uh, or you know the speaker. Yes. See, that's what I'm thinking, but it just doesn't quite work with this riddle. It feels like I'm... It feels like I'm really close, but I'm not quite sure if it's a session in the House of Parliament they're referring to, or an MP themselves, because there's parts of it which sound like one and parts that sound like the other. But I feel like... It's something along those lines. In 1260... This is the last paragraph I'm going to read, incidentally. In 1263, one of his most radical barons, Simon de Montfort, seized power resulting in the Second Baron's War. Henry persuaded Louis to support his cause and mobilised an army. The Battle of Lewes occurred in 1264, where Henry was defeated and taken prisoner. Henry's eldest son, Edward, escaped from, cap to es escaped from captivity to defeat de Montfort at the Battle of... Evesham the following year and freed his father. Henry initially enacted a harsh revenge on the remaining re rebels but was persuaded by the church to modify his policies through the dictum of Kenilworth. Kenilworth. Uh, reconstruction was slow and Henry had to acquiesce to various measures including further suppression uh, of the Jews to maintain baronial and popular support. Henry died in 1272 leaving Edward as his successor. It was buried in Westminster Abbey which had rebuilt in the second half of his reign and was moved to his current tomb in 1290. Some miracles were declared after his death, however, he was not canonised. Henry's reign of 56 years was the longest in medieval English history and would not be surpassed by an English or later British monarch until that of George III in the 19th century. Uh, so, no additional help there, mainly just the connection to Magna Carta. So, I don't have any Oh, no worries, mindful. No worries at all. Um, so, I don't know precisely what it is. Obviously, anyone in chat is welcome to guess as well. But I'm guessing it's something to do with Parliament. A member of Parliament.
Whew. I may not have had it exactly, but I'm I uh, I'm pleased with that one. Uh, so sixty three. No roast can boast a lovelier hue than I can with my birth. When my birth is new, of shorter date than is that flower, I bloom and fade within an hour. Though some in their honour place, I bear the token of disgrace, like my plot eager to reveal the secrets I would fain conceal. Fools co coxcombs wits agree in this, they equally destroy my peace. Though against my will to stoop so low, at their command I come and go. Um, the answer mindful was a member of parliament. No rose can boast a lovelier hue than I can when my birth is new. Of shorter date than is that flower, I bloom and fade within an hour. Though some in their honour place, I bear the token of disgrace. Like my plot eager to reveal the secrets I would fain conceal. Fools coxcombs wits agree in this. A coxcomb is a foolish or conceited person. They equally destroy my peace. Though against my will to stoop so low, at their command I come and go. Like my... Uh, how's this pronounced? Uh, my plot, I think. Plot. My plot, I think. Like some in their honour place, I bear the token of disgrace. Like my plot, eager to reveal the secrets I would fain conceal. Okay, so they're pretending to keep something secret, but they're actually very happy to talk about it. Fools Cockcombs wits agree in this, they equally destroy my peace. Against my will to stoop so low, at the command I come and go. Rose can boast a lovelier hue than I can when my birth is new. Of shorter date than is that flower, I bloom and fade within an hour. What blooms other than a flower? Though some in their honour place, I bear the token of disgrace. Like my plot, eager to reveal. Sorry, my plot. Plot. I must be mispronouncing it. Um, I'll, I'll go with my plot. Eager to reveal the secrets I would fain conceal. Fox Scott comes with wits agree in this, they equally destroy my peace. Against my will to stoop so low, at the command I come and go. Who would be at the command of fools to come and go?
blooms and fades within an hour. Not many things don't last an hour. I mean anything that melts might not last an hour but I don't I doubt that's it There are some creatures like mayflies that live very short lives but again I doubt that's it I think a candle would last longer when lit and it certainly wouldn't be eager to reveal secrets I fain conceal. Besides a person, what could hold secrets which it's only pretending to conceal? I suppose a letter maybe? Arguably. But it wouldn't have a lovely hue. I don't know. I'm going to look it up. Very briefly, I entertained at the end the idea that it might be a fine wine or something like that, but I don't think that figures. I don't see what that would have to do with concealing secrets. You know, with the idea that you'd open a bottle and it would be gone within an hour and it would have a lovely hue. But again, like nothing to do with secrets. That doesn't figure. A blush. A blush! Of course, that makes sense. I like that one. It's a pity I didn't think of it. So, thank you for coming everyone, I hope you enjoyed the stream, I'll be streaming again on Friday with some more Pokemon Crystal, I will likely also be streaming on Saturday with some more of that, come Monday I will be returning to Grim Fandango and then next Wednesday it will be back to Poetry, Prose and Riddles. Uh, I think we will raid Oheyo Hina. 
So once again, thank you all for coming and I hope you have a lovely night.